welcome to the Fit and Healthy Today show. And today our topic matter is mononucleosis. Um, this personally affected my family when my son came down with it um, towards the middle of June, about a month ago. And boy, right before graduation, there was a lot of stress and uh, final exams and everything else before he graduated from Cal Poly. And he came down with mono. Now, what's interesting about this is it affects all of us. All of us get exposed. Uh, we tend, or the people that tend to get it, tend to be people that are under age uh, 35 because by the time we're 35, we've already manufactured the antibodies and 95% of us are immune to it. But the younger ones, particularly in college age where you've got kids around, you know, drinking fountains and parties and, and cafeterias and everything, it's extremely contagious on silverware, drinks, give a good kiss to a friend, and it has an incubation period in uh, adult, like college age kids, of between 30 and 50 days. So it can just hold around and then it looms up. Now in smaller children, it only has a 10 day incubation period. Now it is an infectious disease, as I described, and 85% is caused by the Epstein-Barr virus. 15% uh, by the cytomegalovirus, which is a little bit rare. Um, it is in the herpes family, so it's responsive to uh, some antiviral treatments. There is very little that medical uh, science can do for it other than if it gets bad enough, the throat swells enough, they can give you an anti-inflammatory steroid to take some of the inflammation away. Um, the symptoms are the glands, it's like a chipmunk, swell and literally when you open the throat you can see that the glands are actually closing off the airway. And oftentimes you'll see just one side closing off and then it'll move to the other side. And it's the glands, uh, most of the time in the neck, it can also appear in the groin, the armpits, the bronchial tubes, and then of course into the liver and the spleen. Um, in severe cases or more severe, uh, in over half, you'll get a swelling of the spleen and a little bit of pain on the uh, lower, you know, right abdominal side as well too. Other symptoms are fever, uh, extreme fatigue, a little bit of depression. Uh, they'll just all of a sudden not want to do anything. Severe sore throat. So oftentimes doctors will misdiagnose it and they'll think, oh, we've got a case of streptococcus here. Here, here's the antibiotics. And it's kind of funny, I, I, right when my son was suffering from this, he got a proper diagnosis. Uh, Dr. Ekstrom's office did a great job. You know, they cultured it, the strep came back negative, and the, the PA that was over there, she uh, did a culture for mono and I'll be doggone, it came back positive. A lot of doctor's offices will culture and go ahead and give you antibiotics for mono, which actually can make it worse. Because remember, antibiotics only work for bacterial infections and they can cause your immune system to go down. So it is strongly, strongly suggested uh, to physicians and to parents and people who may have this, that if it comes out negative on a strep culture initially, go ahead and have them run the monoculture as well too. Um, Appetite as well gets very suppressed. It's a little bit different than what you get with strep because when you look at the strep, you'll see real, real kind of red tissues oftentimes, but with mono, literally the glands just swell huge inside the throat and you can see it. You get body aches. And I mentioned the right side from the, uh, the liver aspect, but you can also notice on the spleen, the left side in the, uh, l the upper abdominal area as well too in the spleen can ache as well. Oftentimes we see body aches all over the entire body. This is not a disease or virus that I would wish on, on my worst enemy because I watched my son suffer and it was not a happy thing. Now, um, when I looked up or look up diets and when he was suffering, I, I kind of knew already what to do. They oftentimes cannot swallow, just like with the strep uh, exposure they can't swallow, the glands are so swollen, it hurts like anything. And so what I found to be most successful as a mom and treatment of my customers is if you do a nice smoothie. Pull out the good blender, um, the Nutribullet, the Vitamix particularly, 
The reason why is these smoothies, we want to put as much greens and vegetables in there, uh, carrots, whatever we can put in there to alkali the blood. Uh, some fruit as well too, along with a scoop of some source of vegetable-based protein, rice, pea, uh, that type of thing. Remember, they're not going to feel like eating, so you're not going to be slamming meat uh, down their gullet. So if we can put in some, some type of vegetable-based protein in there. Now, protein is necessary for the immune system. So it's very, very important you're not just serving them broths and applesauce and stuff like that. It's not going to be enough. So that's where the smoothies come into play uh, three times a day. You can add those super greens, the kale, the spinach, the carrots. That's what I did with Ian. Now, Ian had a severe case, but in nine days, he was almost totally over it other than a little bit of fatigue. This um, virus can go on for months and months. So if you follow this protocol, I think you're gonna have a lot of good success. And I have subsequently and in the previously used this protocol and it works very, very well to get people over it, usually within two to three weeks, the majority of the symptoms. Um, absolutely no sugar, white flour, pasta, starches, no red meats, no pork. They're not going to feel like eating that anyway because they're hurting and swelling. But the reason why is we want to keep the inflammation down. No dairy. Dairy increases mucus and believe you me, gross as it may be, they're going to be spewing up mucus left and right. And hopefully you got a lot of paper towels handy and ready to be thrown in the trash can because that's a real annoying thing that happens when you do have mono is you are going to have a lot of mucus coming up in the throat and the nasal passages. Avoid tomatoes, potatoes, eggplant, pepper, and oranges. Trying to keep the pH as alkali as we can. And the tomatoes, potatoes, eggplant, and peppers are nightshade vegetables and they produce a glucoalkaloid that doesn't allow you to get rid of inflammation. So when you're inflamed, the last thing you want to throw on there is some tomato juice or a warm tomato soup or potatoes. Uh, that, that happened to a, a friend of mine when she got out of the hospital recently with tons of inflammation, and this is what the hospital served her. So yeah, avoid these when you have inflammation. Now supplement-wise, um, you're going to want to hit it from every which angle. You want it gone as soon as possible because once again, if it swells up there, it can close off the breathing and then you're on the steroidals and you've got immunosuppressing and you're going to be sick for months. This is probably one of the most unpleasant, other than shingles, one of the most unpleasant um, diseases to have uh, that pretty much interferes with any everyday activity. It would be virtually impossible for you to go to work when you're suffering with a full-blown case of mononucleosis. Number one, supplement-wise, probiotics. And, and I wrote down on the uh, information that you're looking at, 16 billion. But in my most perfect world, I'd have you take 50 billion on an empty stomach twice a day. Remember, we now know that 75, 80% of our immune system stems in our gut. So if I can get the good bacteria levels up, then it's going to help the immune system be more responsive. Oregano oil. Now, mind you, we're going to have to do this in the liquid. Oregano oil, and I like it with a combination of grapefruit seed extract. Um, preferably, the drops are the best. I, I wrote the pills on here in oregano oil, but seriously, you really want it hitting the glands and hitting the back of the throat. The liquids are going to get into the system a little bit better. And so I've got three drops of oregano oil and 30 drops of grapefruit seed extract in about two ounces of water three to four times a day. You're just really going to try to knock out this virus as best you can. And since it's a herpes-based uh, virus, we also bump in lysine. Now, lysine is an amino acid that helps uh, with the immune system. That's why I'm, I'm wanting you not to do so much meat and some of the arginine-rich foods that you're getting with chicken and, and turkey. A lot of people say, oh, serve homemade chicken soup. Not when you have this type of a virus. A lot of vegetables, vegetable-based proteins. Um, you're going to need to keep essential fatty acids up. And later on in the list, I have listed a little bit of flax oil and borage oil because the last thing you're going to want to be eating are nuts. But we want to reduce the inflammation down, so using a little bit of a teaspoon of flaxseed oil and a little bit of borage oil, you can put them in the smoothies, 
is going to help reduce the inflammation down. Aster C. Anytime you're dealing with herpes simplex virus, whether it's cold sores, um, herpes oyster, uh, as well with shingles, uh, chicken pox, or herpes virus in the case of mononucleosis, you've got to keep your vitamin C levels good. And I'm talking 2,000 milligrams three times a day. You can get it in a powdered form or capsule form. You've got to slam this. This also helps the mucous membranes repair the tissues much quicker because remember the collagen matrix this is all expansive tissue and it's going to really get the immune system in order. It, the C also helps with the liver and the ability of the liver to be able to detoxify during mono. Elderberry extract. Now elderberry extract stops viral replication so two teaspoons three times a day on the elderberry extract, extract can help stop the viral replication from occurring. Raw honey, I'll tell you, this is a buddy. I, I prefer Manuka honey, but any type of raw honey, and I'm not talking from your grocery store or your major department store where it's only 10% honey. I'm talking about the solid raw honey unheated. That really can help with some of the healing and reduce some of the pain. Also a suggestion, half a teaspoon of sea salt in a, in a warm cup of water and gargle with that as best you can can help reduce some of the pain as well too. Now, we worry about as this progresses onward with the, the liver and the spleen. And so what we try to do is we try to give some supportive herbs in order to help those detoxify. And milk thistle and dandelion really aid and abet the detoxification of the liver. And they also help the liver enzymes and some of the swelling. The flax oil that I mentioned on here in the borage oil also help with the liver inflammation in, in the uh, liver and the spleen, as well as the ester C. Do the best you can to get a good multiple vitamin down. Once again, your Bs, your minerals, we're trying to give your immune system the best fighting chance that it can do. But if we have to, we can do a liquid in a smoothie or a nice uh, gel cap. You know, when you're talking about mono, once again, I want to conclude by mentioning that it's very, 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 very important that you really get a good diagnosis. Question it. You know, if the doctor puts it off and says, you're going to wait for three days, I'm going to tell you, um, when my son went over to the urgent care at Dr. Eckstrom's office, I, it, within an hour and a half, he was back with a diagnosis. You want that diagnosis, and anybody that prolongs this for you, just prolongs the agony and the ability of this viral replication to take place. That's it for this portion. Next, we're going to be moving on to the fitness portion of our show. Thank you. Hi, welcome to the fitness portion of our show. And I want to show a few exercises that can help with some glandular swelling that you may incur when you have something like mononucleosis or a cold or that type of thing. What we want to do is we want to get the lymphatic system moving on a little bit quicker. Now I know this sounds a little ridiculous, but I always instruct anybody when they're ill to do 20 jumping jacks three times a day. That jumping motion where you're flapping your arms, you know, we've got the armpits swollen, and you're jumping, just the standard old-fashioned jumping jacks really can help move the lymphatic system along throughout the body. Now when we're talking about, particularly in this area, there's a couple of exercises that I think could be very, very helpful. One of which, and this is a yoga position, involves acting like you've got a pencil that goes underneath, like you're holding a pencil, and you can literally grab a pencil and do this. When you pull that in, it pulls all the glands and it tightens it and it squeezes it. So it's a little bit better than massaging it because literally you're using your own muscles to push and squeeze on there without causing any harm. And oftentimes those little glands are pretty swollen and they're painful. Another exercise that I really like that gets movement is just a light pat touch. Now when you're patting something when it's swollen, it's kind of a, like a little thump. It's kind of like wake up here. So I like a little bit of that padding underneath, all around the glands. Then do your pencil and pull it in. And I think what will happen is, is you're kind of getting, it's kind of like you're shaking up a protein shake. You know, when you're doing a little padding around there, it kind of shakes it up. 
and then you're squeezing it out. That's probably going to be some very helpful movements that you can do. But once again, 20 jumping jacks three times a day whenever you feel sick or you have any swollen lymphatic, whether it's in your throat or throughout your body. Next, we're going to be moving on to the research portion of our show. Thank you very much. Hi, welcome to the research portion of our show, and with us is Ralph Turciano. And thank you for that intro. Well, the long-running saga, uh, what appears to be more of a script line out of an Austin Powers Dr. Evil bit, the promotion of high fructose corn syrup in order to dominate the U.S. population, therefore rule the world, is still being promoted pretty heavily. But what we noticed today is the data that came out of high fructose corn syrup. What they discovered, this was from the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. So this is just not some nobody. And what they said is this. A calorie, is a calorie a calorie? Or are they all created equal? Based on this study, we would say not. What is wrong with high fructose corn syrup now? Well, if you're still consuming it because you have that unbearable sweet tooth, which somehow thinks that high fructose corn syrup is somehow much, much better for you than sugar, this may change your mind. What they looked at was this. First, they did a study on high fructose corn syrup and monkeys. Of course, monkeys got to eat basically high fructose corn syrup over seven years, compared to a controlled group of monkeys who just basically ate a regular low-fat diet. And both they consumed the same amount of calories. What they discovered was this. Those who ate high fructose corn syrup gained 50% more weight than the control group because remember high fructose corn syrup makes the fat cells bigger. Therefore, you could store more. They developed diabetes at three times the rate of the control group, meaning you get the advantage of added benefit of missing a limb or two after a shorter period of time. And also developed hepatitis stasosis or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. How many of you have been to a doctor and basically the doctor says you have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or you have a fatty liver and ask you whether you've been drinking or not. Well, maybe not drinking, maybe you're consuming a little bit too many Krispy Kreme donuts. All right, what they said also too, they looked at this and they said, hey, let's back this up. Let's do a short-term study on high fructose corn syrup because we noticed it does liver damage. We really wanna know how that works. So they did a six-week trial and this is what they discovered in high fructose corn syrup in six weeks, and they did a controlled group at the same time. All right, they discovered that high fructose corn syrup has an unusual insidious effect of not altering the bacteria in the gut, but causing bacteria in the gut to migrate to the liver. And they said, the researchers measured the biomarkers of liver damage to blood samples and examined what type of bacteria was in the intestine due to fecal samples and intestinal biopsies. What surprised us most? was how quickly the liver was affected and how extensive the damage was, especially without weight gain. Says six weeks in monkeys is roughly about the equivalent of three months to humans. What that means is three months of high fructose corn syrup consumption where it's at least 24% of your calories, you're developing liver damage. Just three months. How many kids are brought up on high fructose corn syrup? And this is just the start. In the high fructose corn syrup group, the researchers found that the intestinal bacteria hadn't changed, but they were migrating to the liver and more rapidly and causing damage there. It appears that something about high fructose levels was causing the intestines to be less protective, meaning causing the intestinal tracts to basically ulcerate and erode, allowing other things to go places where they don't normally belong, like undigested food and the like less protective than normal because of the erosion of the intestinal tract, and consequently allowing the bacteria to leak out at a 30% higher rate. So, the research conclude that high fructose corn syrup, if you want to lose your liver pretty fast, gain some weight, get a lot of diabetes, you could fall for the propaganda videos of just being another corn sugar, or you could actually listen to data and studies. We're not saying don't eat sugar and don't eat sweets, we're just saying eat the sugar and sweets like your grandma or grandparents used to make. High fructose corn syrup is the bane of modern society and is one of the reasons why 
we need universal health care. Which comes to the next point. We look at Americans as far as our average health in correlation to prescription drugs. And this study came out of the Mayo Clinic. Well, guess how many Americans are taking it up on any one point of time are on prescription drugs now? We're talking man, woman, and child. Well, that number is seven out of 10, which makes us pretty much a very, very, very codependent society. So, henceforth, the need for universal health care once again. Guess how many are on two prescription drugs at any one time? 50% of US citizens. Mm. And guess how many are on five prescription drugs at any one time or more? 20% of Americans. So you think about that, one out of five people are taking more than five prescription drugs at any one time. Probably because the high fructose corn syrup they're consuming, but beside that point, they're doing it which makes a very, very highly codependent society. There's got to be a better way. The thing that disturbed the research the most is the second most prescribed, and most Americans seem to be on, medication is antidepressants, which means there's a serious, serious mental health issue with the United States right now. And guess what came in a close third? Opiates. So, we are a drugged out, hallucinating, delusional society who's looking to escape from reality, which can explain a lot of the problems happening within society because it's beginning to disjoint our ability to rationalize logic properly. So, you cannot uh, make judgment calls well when you have people which are taking medications which change their view of how reality actually is. All right, now, after that, Seven out of 10 Americans, that bad news, and I apologize for pitting you over and over again with this segment with negatives, but you're not gonna hear from TV news, so someone's gotta say something. Mm -hmm. All right, after that, guess what? Antidepressants do. Well, a lot of people take antidepressants for post-traumatic stress syndrome. That's a no-no. Why is that bad? Because an article published in Biological Psychiatry, again, not a no-name publication or some guy that's worshiping crystals from the planet of Venus. This published in the Biological Psychiatry. They discovered that generally, well, let's read you the title. It says, do antidepressants impair the ability to extinguish fear? Extinguish fear meaning getting rid of fear. And guess what? They do. Meaning, in layman's terms, if you have post-traumatic stress syndrome and you're taking an antidepressant, you get to live that fear over and over and over. Where your colleagues that may not be taking the antidepressants or, other or doing other type of medical interventions will eventually overcome their fears. So that antidepressants have a chance of keeping you in a constant state of terror as long as you're on them especially long-term. doesn't appear to be short-term, but long-term. Now let's go back to the study. <sighs> they don't understand exactly how these SSRIs affect memory and is poorly understood. As a follow-up, they have now tested the effects of antidepressants on extinction learning in animals using auditory fear conditioning, a model of fear learning that involves the amygdala. Oh, I can't pronounce it, amygdala. Dala. The amygdala is a region of the brain vitally important for process of memory and emotion. They found that long-term but not short-term SSI treatment impairs extinction learning, henceforth getting over fear, which is the ability to learn that a conditioned stimulus no longer predicts an aversive effect. This impairment may have important consequences clinically since extinction-based exposure therapy is often used to treat anxiety disorders and antidepressants are often administered simultaneously meaning that the antidepressants are going to impair the ability to get over your fears or over this extinction learning. The authors suggest for this effect of fear learning, they reported that the antidepressants decreased the level of the subunits of the NMDA receptors, NR2B, for those who want to get into the science of it, and the amygdala. The NMDA receptors are critically involved in the fear-related learning. Henceforth, you want to get, not get over your fears? You don't want to adapt to a stressor or post-traumatic stress as, as hard as it is? Take antidepressants and you'll be in fear 
long as you're on them, most likely. Now, and I apologize again, because you may want to wash your hands of that, but however though, antibacterial soaps. All right, now, obviously we know triclosan is known for basically causing muscle weakness, and at the same time too, causing cancer, prostate cancer, particularly in the whole lineup. And the antibacterial soaps work no better than regular soap that our grandparents used to use, but somehow we still like to take them because of government propaganda and TV propaganda working in conjunction with each other, not using science, but obviously using marketing. And again, henceforth, antidepressants, drugs, high fructose corn syrup are not based in science. They're based on merchandising. So to our next merchandised item, it's called triclosan or otherwise known as triclocarbine. It may harm nursing babies. And not only it harmed them, the UT study, which said basically, it may reduce the survival rates. All right, this is what they had. This came out of Knoxville. They said, and also, sorry, this was printed in the Endocrine Society's 95th Annual Meeting and Expo in San Francisco. Kennedy was the study's lead author. Again, not a know-nothing organization. These are the doctors and medical researchers. They're trying to warn you, but they can't get past the merchandising. And a lot of doctors, unfortunately, do not read or keep up to date in things outside of what the drug companies teach them. Sounds cliche-ish, but unfortunately, that all the data points out that it's true. Otherwise, you wouldn't be taking half the stuff. The researchers know they were not condemning the use of antibacterial soaps. So whatever that means, go for it. People have to weigh their own risk and decide what would be the best route. They conducted an early study with uh, triclosan or tri uh, antibacterial soaps to affect the growth of sex uh, hormones in adult male rats. Can you decide to go a step further and look how it would affect baby rats in the womb during nursing? And they use as much soap or antitriclosan you'd be exposed to just by doing a 15 minute shower. Even though the mothers may have had it in their system prior to birth, it did not affect the baby that was born. But if that mother was nursing and using antibacterial soap, the average pups or the animals born to mice, guess how long they lived before they died. Average life expectancy was just six days. Just six days. And guess what? Your sewage system, water sewer treatment, water treatment system only removes 95%, which may sound like a high number, but when you consider the amount of antibacterial soap being used or antibacterial chemicals being used in toothpaste, chemicals, food, everything, you can't escape it. You need to ban it. Well, that's it. My time is up, and thank you for that. Thank you very much. Once again, do your research, and you can also catch our show on youtube.com forward slash VH film. Thank you very much.